Last week we started a new series on the names of God. And we looked at, as you can see on the wall over here, the Lord is our shepherd and what that means and what that looks like. And throughout this whole series, we've got these banners uh, that have been in several rooms throughout the church. Uh, right now they're in a room down uh, the Green Hall. And we're, we're doing a series about each of these names of God and uh, going to have these banners up here as we do each one of these names and then hang them on the wall. Um, so we can remember each one of these names. Names are important, uh, especially in Scripture. Yeah, I said it like right here. And this morning it's true vine. Let's see if you can slide it on in there. There we go. Good deal. These banners are something else, aren't they? You know, names in Scripture are important, uh, and they were thought of as very important. Even back in the day when the copyists would take the Old Testament, the, 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 the scribes, the Old Testament scribes would by hand copy all the Scripture they had. But they had such reverence for the name of God that when they came to the name of God, they would set down their pen, pick up a brand new pen that had never been used before. They would dip it in the ink, they would write the name of God, and they would take that pen and set it aside, never to be used again. They thought God's name was so valuable that they would only use that pen one time to write God's name, which in Hebrew is just four letters. You ever heard the name Yahweh? That's the name that they would come to and write that name. Take a new pen, write it out, set that pen aside, only use it once. But Yahweh in Hebrew, they have such reverence for that name, it has no vowels. So it's, it's unpronounceable in Hebrew, the name of God. You, they, they can't say it. So what they would do, you know, they had such you know, reverence for the name of God, they would never let it come across their lips, they would never write it with a, a, a pen that was used to write just random other words, they would write with a fresh pen. Uh, what they would do to try to prevent themselves from saying the name of God, uh, besides it having no vowels, being unpronounceable, is they took the vowels from another word in Scripture, from another name for God, the name Lord or Adonai. You ever heard that name? Well, they took the Hebrew letters for the word Adonai, the, vo the vowels from Adonai, and put it on Yahweh so that they wouldn't run the risk of accidentally, even though it doesn't have any vowels, saying the name of God. And so they put those vowels under it and came up with a whole new word. And I know you've all heard this word. You might know it. Jehovah. Jehovah. It's not actually a word in Scripture. It's a created word by the Jews to prevent themselves from accidentally saying Yahweh. And so they took this word, and so every time they would read Scripture out loud, when they came to that, those four consonants, Yahweh, they could not pronounce, they would say Jehovah. And that's developed and, and been used and developed into, you know, Christendom and, and the Christian culture around the Middle Ages or something, and it's used frequently in a lot of ways. But they had, all that stems back to how much they valued just the name of God just the name of God, before even getting into his character and his worship. It's a whole new level of worship to where they had such awe of who God is, they wouldn't even say his name. So names are important. Names are very important. So that when they came to certain moments in their lives, they would mark those moments as a moment of remembrance by not creating a new name of God, but saying, God did this for me. Like next week, the name we're going to look at is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. And so there's a moment when the Lord provided. And so they said, I'm going to remember this moment by saying, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. So every time they say that name, it was a reminder of what God had done for them. 
And so as we look throughout, particularly the Old Testament, they did that. And in the New Testament, Jesus began to open our eyes to some descriptions of God that reveal more about his character and his nature. As we're going to look today, the true vine. This is in John chapter 15 on page 901. If you want to turn there on the Bible on the pew rack, page 901, uh, where we're going to be, John chapter 15. Uh, if you don't have a Bible at home, please take that Bible in the pew rack home. We've got more in boxes in the uh, workroom that we can replace that one with. Please take that Bible home. That's why we have them here. On well, page 901, talking about the true vine. As I studied this this week, a, uh, a story came to mind, a remembrance. Um, you know, when astronauts go into outer space. Anybody want to be an astronaut when they were a kid? Nobody? A few of you? Nobody? Few, some of you are afraid. I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid. Uh, I grew up in Houston, though, too, so <laughs> I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, but then I got too tall. You know, the, the cap on astronaut, I think, it's, I think it's 6'4", because when you get to outer space, your spine expands. Uh, and so that's my excuse for not becoming an astronaut. I wouldn't have fit in the seat when we came home. So that's why I didn't become an astronaut. Never mind the math and the science and, you know, flying planes and stuff. That's the reason I didn't become an astronaut. But when astronauts go to outer space and they do their spacewalks, they're not just free as a bird out there in outer space. They're always tethered with some kind of line back to either the spacecraft or the space station in some capacity, if they're out there, even if they're crawling along trying to fix something, they're always tethered with at least one line, sometimes two. Even if they take out those little jetpacks to do their, you know, flying around in outer space, it's always, even those things, tethered back to the space station or their spacecraft. Because when you're in outer space, you don't have points of reference. You don't really know how far away the thing is. And it'd be hard to, to, to hit it if you're out there. Or if you're out there without the jetpack, there's no, like, cartoon flying through space to get back to the thing. I mean, you're floating off like, like George Clooney in gravity, and you're just going, and you're gone, never coming back. Always staying tethered, because what you're really doing is you're tethered to life. You're tethered to what will give you life. Even if you, you lose hold of what you're grabbing onto, and you float out there, that tether's going to yank you back. And the friends you have are going to pull you in because you're tethered to what's going to give you life. And that's what we're going to look at in John chapter 15, being tethered to life. You see, this John chapter 15 passage, this comes right in the middle of this massive section of Jesus' teaching. All this at the end of the book of John, before Jesus gets arrested, it takes place the night before he's arrested, when he's in the midst of the Lord's Supper, the uh, communion, Passover meal with his disciples. I think it goes all the way back to uh, John chapter 12 uh, there. Uh, no, John chapter 13. Starts in John 13 and goes on uh, over the next several chapters. Jesus does some of the uh, Lord's Supper. He washes the disciples' feet. Um, then Judas leaves to go get the mob, and Jesus keeps on teaching his other disciples uh, some massive, really important teachings he's giving them, almost as a, 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 a last words to them. He says, I want you to remember this stuff. I'm about to be arrested. I'm going to be uh, beaten and crucified. I'm going to die, but I'm going to raise from the dead. But before all of that happens, you need to ingest this stuff, kind of like a, a, a night before your final cram session. You need to know this. And so here in John 15, this is like smack dab in the middle of all that teaching. Jesus begins to say in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So he says, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser, the one who takes care of the vine. Uh, so every branch, whether it's a branch that produces fruit or a branch that doesn't produce fruit, every branch is touched by the vine dresser. Every branch is touched in some capacity by the vine dresser, even uh, either taken away or some translation raised up off of the ground or pruned, snipped 
clipped in certain elements to get more nutrients to the fruit that's on those branches. That's why the vine dresser prunes the branch so that the nutrients don't go to every random twig that's sticking off there. You prune the ones that don't have any fruit so all the nutrients go to the ones that do have fruit. So if you've got fruit, he's going to prune you. If you don't have fruit, you're going to be addressed. You're going to be taken care of as we're going to get to in just a moment. So every branch is addressed by the vine dresser. Look at verse 3. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So he says, you've already got something in you because of the word. You've already got something that word is important because of where he's going with this. He says, you are clean. You have something in you of strength. You have something in you that can guide you to where you need to be going. You have something in you in the word if you pay attention to it. Uh, verse 4. So it says, because you have the word, verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. This word abide means to remain, to continue, to stay. So he says, continue in me and I'm going to continue in you. Jesus will always, Jesus isn't going to stop being with us. He will always be with us. But the thing in that verse that he's saying, he doesn't say, be with me, and then only when you are with me will I be with you. He's saying, abide in me, and I, and he says, I will be with you always. Nothing can stop that. But the instruction is for us to be with him, to abide with him, remain with him, to be connected to him, connected to the vine. And allow his life-giving nutrients to flow through our spirit. He says, remain in me. Stay in me. Stay connected to me. Don't raise your hand, but do you ever get disconnected from Jesus in some capacity or another? That's why he's given this instruction to him. Stay connected to me. Abide in me. Look at verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, I want to point something out that it's easy to miss, and I missed in my first pass, uh, but good old Tony Evans showed me the way in one of his commentaries. Uh, If you look back in verse 2, he starts off talking about those who have no fruit. So they have no fruit. And then he talks about some uh, who have some fruit. So he goes from no fruit to some fruit. And then at the end of verse 2, he says they, you can have more fruit. So no fruit, some fruit, more fruit. And now here in verse 5, how much fruit can you have? Much fruit. And he goes on from there down to verse 16. Let's read that. And then we'll come back to this section. But back down to verse 16. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Talking to his disciples to go and do the work. And that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So abiding fruit. So it's a, it's a developmental process. No fruit, some fruit, more fruit, much fruit, and then down to verse 16, abiding fruit. So fruit that itself is abiding. So if we are supposed to abide, if we are supposed to remain, if we are supposed to continue in the vine, stay connected to the vine, then he says in verse 16, the fruit that we produce is supposed to itself abide, remain, continue, stay connected to the vine. So any clue as to what the fruit is? It is how you live, living for Jesus. But the fruit is the people that we share the gospel with. The fruit Because how else can that fruit abide unless they are people themselves? If our instruction is to abide, so must also the people that we bring to Christ, just as the Great Commission. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. He says, go and make disciples. And those disciples, those people who hear the gospel and receive the gospel will be that fruit, that abiding fruit. So again, it's a process of progress that we make from no fruit to some fruit to more fruit to much fruit and then producing abiding fruit. And then we get to verse 6. And I'll tell you, just preface this as we get into it. This is one of the most discussed sections of this entire passage. 
So get ready. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. So if anyone does not abide, if anyone is not connected to me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Now, I will tell you, reading these commentaries, reading these other scholars on this, there is a vast difference of opinion because it comes down to two things. In this verse, is Jesus talking about Christians being disconnected from the vine, or is Jesus talking about non-Christians being thrown away into the fire? Because sometimes in Scripture, when it talks about being burned, it's talking about judgment. Not always, just sometimes. And at first glance, that to me is what it seems like. And you're welcome to disagree with my opinion on this all you want. This is just where I came to this, studying these guys and looking into the original language here. This is my thought. Because to me, the wording in this verse, the way Jesus phrases this is very important. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away. Thrown away. How is he thrown away? Like a branch and withers. So anyone not abiding in Jesus, anyone not connected to Jesus, withers. That word withers literally means to dry up, to dry out. They wither up. But where it came to me, this person who isn't connected to Jesus is like a branch thrown aside from the vine. Uh, But what really stuck out to me is what those words that Jesus uses next. He says, uh, let's see, verse 6. And the branches. So he's just been talking about a branch, a single individual. Now he shifts and talks about branches because in the original language there, the, the phrasing is those kinds of branches. Those, not just the branches that have been thrown aside, those people. He's, the phrasing is those kinds of branches, going back to the illustration that he's using. Those branches are gathered together. Those kinds are gathered together. So it seems to me in reading this and diving into this in this way uh, it, it, that Jesus is referencing specifically what happens in a vineyard when branches dry out. He's talking about the people and then he talks about what happens to those branches in a vineyard that dry out. They're tossed into the fire because they're not useful. And so I think the way Jesus is phrasing this here. His use of words here refers to the relation of usefulness of the branches rather than to the relation of the people and the branches being thrown into the fire. I don't think Jesus is talking about eternity in this verse. I tend to think Jesus is talking about Christians in this verse. Because again, who's he talking to when he's teaching this? His disciples. He's not even talking to Judas. Judas has already left the room. Judas is, in, this is just the guys who are believers in the room when Jesus is saying this. He's saying, abide in me. But if anyone does not abide, they're going to wither up. They're going to dry out. They're going to dry out. And what happens to dried out branches in a vineyard? They're tossed into the fire because they're useless. Jesus, to me, in reading this, is saying, do not be useless. Stay connected to the vine. Look at verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now this is key because he said it a minute ago talking about his words. If you stay connected to me, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, my words are connected in you, my words remain in you and are alive in you, then when you pray, something's going to be different in you. If you have my words in you, that's... Part of how we stay connected to Jesus is having his word in us. Having his word in us. If we don't have his word in us, how can we be changed by it? How can we be transformed by it? How can we be different from the world around us, the unbelieving world around us, if we don't have his word in us? He's saying, if you're connected to me, almost it's, it, the way this reads, he's saying, if you're connected to me, my words will be in you. If you're connected to me, my words will be in you. If you're not connected to me, you're not going to be thinking about my words. My words aren't going to be popping into your head. They're going to be off in some other 
place. You may be thinking, oh, there's that verse about that thing and the place, and I don't really know what it means. I don't even know where it is. You're going to even get confused about what's in the Bible. If you're not connected to Jesus, you may start to think of phrases like, cleanliness is next to godliness is in Scripture somewhere. Or colloquial phrases that we have adopted into our culture that aren't really there. Or that something like money is the root of all evil. But if you're not connected to the word, you may not realize that's not actually the scripture. The love of money is the root of all evil. That greed, that selfishness, that pride. He says, stay connected to me. And if you're connected to me, my words will be connected to you. And when we begin to be connected to his word, we begin to use his word in our prayers. And his word changes how we pray. Verse 8. He said, so, by this, my father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So, (laughs) I love Jesus, and I love the way he talks. Here in this verse, this is how God's glorified. I mean, this is, he's breaking it down for his disciples. You ever be, have you ever been talking to somebody or maybe talking to your kids and you can tell they're zoning out? And it's like, okay, here's the point. Just hear this right now. Jesus says, okay, guys, <laughs> this is how God is glorified. Just bear much fruit. As we talked about earlier, bear much fruit. And when you do that, you prove that you're my disciples. You prove it, not that you need to prove it to God, he knows our hearts, but you prove it to yourself and to those around you. Not that that matters, what other people think, what other people want, that's not the issue. But he's saying demonstrating what you have in your heart, in your life, is what he desires of us. If we say we're followers of God, if we say we're connected to the vine, then we need to act like it. We need to act like it. Not pretend, not, not put on you know, a front or, or fake it, but act like we are one of his. Prove that we are his disciples by how we live and how we act and what we do. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so, I, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. So again, being connected to Jesus means what? Being connected to the love of God. Connecting to Jesus connects us to the love of God. God loves us generally as for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. John 3, 16, that's there, yes. And we can never be disconnected from God's love. His love will always be connected to us. Because he's always connected to us. But the question is, are we connected to him? His love will always flow towards us, always be aimed at us. He was always faithful. But will we return that and be connected to him? Let me give you an illustration. If you ever read any section of the Old Testament, it's a great demonstration of this. God loves Israel. God came in Genesis chapter 3 and gave them a promise. Adam and Eve, you guys broke the covenant. All you had to do was not eat of that tree, and we'd be here forever, walking together. You know, they walked with him physically, daily, in the Garden of Eden. And they disobeyed God. They, they saw the fruit of the tree and were drawn to it like a craving towards this thing that was away from God. They had a craving to, to really, honestly, be connected to a different vine. And they believed the lies of the enemy and walked a path away from God and disconnected themselves from him that day. Broke their covenant. But God did not abandon his side. His love still flowed towards the people and said, okay, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be consequences naturally. You broke it, but I'm going to stay with you and one of your descendants is going to come and save the world. And this happened repeatedly. God came to a man named Abram, became Abraham. And said, one of your descendants is going to come, and the whole world's going to be saved because of your descendants. Just follow me. Again, God gave Abraham a covenant. That was it. So what does Abraham do? Follows for a while and then stops following. Covenant broken. On his side, he disconnected himself. But did God disconnect himself? No. 
he was still faithful. So God comes along. Well, actually, even before Abraham, God came to Noah and said, here's a covenant. I'm not going to flood the world as proof of it. Here's my rainbow. It's going to be there for all time. Just follow me. Did the people follow him? No. They broke it. But did God break his side? No, God's still faithful. And then Abraham came along, covenant. People broke it. God kept his. God comes along to Moses and says, hey, Moses, I want you to go and you, you tell the people, one of the Israelites is going to come in the future. He's going to be my son and he's going to save the world. Just follow me. How long did it take the Israelites to break that one? Before Moses got even done writing it down. They were down in the camp breaking it. When he, before he put the period on the end of the sentence, they had already broken the covenant. But did God abandon them and break his side? No. Because he says, he abided in them. He stayed in them. His love still flowed towards them. He still brought Jesus, but they broke the covenant anyway. But Jesus didn't. And then God came to David. He said, one of your descendants is going to come and save the world. Here's my covenant to you. Just follow me. And did David keep the covenant? No. What did David do? Committed adultery? Killed the husband of the lady he had adultery with? And among a whole bunch of other stuff he did wrong. But did God abandon the people? No. God kept his side every single time. When the people broke the covenant every single time, God didn't stop. Because God continues to abide. God continues to remain. God continues to have his love flow towards us. And what we see here, Jesus is saying again in John 15, uh, verse 9, as the Father has loved me, I love you, so abide in my love. The love is there. Jesus said, I have loved you. My love is there. Now you just stay connected to me and the love is there. You just love me. I'm, my love's never going to stop. You can do whatever, but my love's not going to stop. We don't do stuff to get his love. He loves us. And so our lives should be a response to his love for us. So he says, abide in my love. Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, he's not saying that his love is conditional on our obedience. He's not saying, if you keep my commandments then I'm going to give you love. Again, we just we saw in verse 9, no, his love is there whether we obey him or not. He's saying, if you follow me, that is your demonstration that you're connected to me. That is your, your, your proof, like he spoke about earlier in the chapter, that you are a part of me. Stay connected to me. Follow me. Back in the Great Commission, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. Follow my commandments. Follow my instruction. Follow. This is Jesus talking. Follow my teachings. And you will be in my love. You will be connected to me. Follow me, he says. Stay connected to me, he says. We are connected to him. Let me phrase it this way. We are never disconnected from his love. His love is always towards us. But what we end up doing is we disconnect ourselves from the influence of his love. His love is always there, but we can disconnect ourselves from the influence of his love. When we disconnect ourselves from him, we stop abiding in him. Hey, again, don't raise your hand, but have you ever been disconnected from the influence of the love of the Father? Maybe that is demonstrated in how you respond to someone else in a less than loving or Christ-like manner. When we're disconnected, when we disconnect ourselves from the influence of his love. If we are connected to his love's influence, we will follow his instructions. We will follow him in his direction, his commandments. If we stay connected to him and the influence of his love. And he says, this is what happens. You stay connected to me. You stay connected to my love. This is what happens. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So if you're connected to Jesus, you're connected to his love, what do you have? 
his joy. He says that there in the middle of verse 11. My joy may be in you. My joy may be in you. My joy. It's not some human-produced, me, self-produced joy, happiness in the moment. It's his joy in me. What did Nehemiah say? The joy of the Lord is my strength. How do I make it through today? His joy in me. It's not a joyful day. It's not a happy day. It's a difficult day. I got this news and I got this stuff happening and the kids are doing this and this over here and this is going on at the job and this is happening in the bank account and this bill came in. I don't know where that came from and it's got 15,000 fees on the deal. I don't know what's going on, but the joy of the Lord is my strength. If we're connected to Jesus, connected to his love, what does that connect us to? His joy. And joy, his joy, cannot be fabricated. You can fake a lot of stuff, but you can't fake the joy of Jesus. The joy of the Lord is my strength. If we're supposed to stay connected to the vine, how really are we to do this? What does this look like? Well, I want you to look back at verse 1. I hinted at it a minute ago. Look back at verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. I am the true vine. The true vine, as we see here on the banner. True vine. True vine implies that there are false vines. If there's a true vine, then there's false vines. If there's true vines, then there's fake ones out there that branches can, can, can disconnect themselves from the true vine and attempt to connect themselves, uh, attempt to get nourishment from some other source. The only way, though, to really live and grow is through connection to the true vine and not the false vines. Because false vines will lie to us. False vines will tell us that we don't need the true vine to get by. We, don't, uh, we would even do well, we would do exceedingly well if we would connect with another vine, some other kind of vine. And, and in the end, just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, we begin to crave what that other vine offers because we're listening to the lies of the enemy. We begin to crave it. If you go back and read Genesis 3, what does it say? Eve looked at the fruit and saw that it was a delight to the eyes and good for food. She began to crave this thing. And when we're disconnected from the vine and we try to attempt to connect ourselves to false vines, other things that are lying to us about trying to nourish us and give us strength and give us courage and give us a way forward and peace, and it's all fake. But when we try to connect ourselves to these other vines, we end up doing great damage to ourselves because we weren't meant to have that stuff pumping through our veins. We were meant to be connected to the true vine, not the fake vine, not the false vines, even though we're craving these things. These false vines that are out there that are lying to us, that they will nourish us, all they really do is numb us and poison us and create a greater disconnect from the true vine. We need the nourishment that comes from the true vine, to have the love and to have the life and to have the joy that he promises. Without that stuff, you go back to verse 6, what will happen? We will wither up, dry up, dry out. Don't point fingers. You ever known any dried up Christians? Dried out Christians? You ever been that? I've been that. Sometimes it's a day-by-day -day thing. <laughs> Moment by moment thing. I need that nourishment. I need to stay connected to the vine. These false vines out there are tools that the enemy will use to prevent us from getting the love and the life and the joy that Jesus offers. And he will do it in a, he's very clever. He's been, Satan's been at this deal for a long time. He's been at this for thousands of years and he's seen people just like you before. He knows what buttons to push. He knows what direction to go to get you to where, you, where he wants you to be. And so he'll try to tempt you in those ways that he has set up. Say, oh, I can do this, and I can tempt them with that. But these days, we've got so many more temptations because of these little devices we got in our pockets. These can be great tools for good. But any great tool for good can be perverted and corrupted and used for evil. And the enemy's good at it. 
And he'll take something like social media that could have been a great source of encouragement that we can build each other up and turn it into a vacuum, a a soul-sucking vampire that pulls out all the spirituality and desire God has for us to go stay connected to the vine and we'll attempt to disconnect from the vine and connect ourselves to these little electronic devices as we doom scroll and we get to the end of an hour and a half and don't even remember anything we just saw. Or maybe it's the news we connect ourselves to, the political ups and downs, the entertainment news. What's that football player doing with that pop singer today? And we'll be all over the place connecting ourselves to, some of y'all are right all up in that mess. I tell you, y'all know about what that concert down in South America, y'all are like, yeah. You connect ourselves to that news, trying to get nourishment from that, get that endorphin kick from that, when we're meant to be connected to the true vine. You say, why don't I have any peace? Why am I so tired? Why am I not getting any sleep? Why is my anxiety shooting through the roof? Because we have disconnected ourselves and attempted to connect ourselves to something else. Maybe we're connecting ourselves to, to the approval of other people. Saying, I need this person to say that's good. I need this person to say that's good. I need this person just to smile at me. And I will feel good and I'll get this. I'll coast for weeks on that. But if we connect to the vine, there's no coasting. We're flying with all kinds of momentum. How do you think Paul was able to stay in prison under the constant threat of being beheaded, being able to encourage other people to find joy? Because he's connected to the vine. If you're connected to the vine, everything changes. If you're connected to the vine, there's no withering up. There's no drying out. Even though the enemy doesn't want us to be influenced by the great love of Jesus, and so he attempts to to disconnect us from the true vine with the allure of a false vine, we can recognize that strategy and say, I'm not leaving. We need to connect with Jesus as though lives depend on it, because they do. We've got to connect to Jesus as though lives depend on it. Our lives depend on it. The lives of other people depend on it. When we're focused on Jesus, we're able to point other people to Jesus and produce that fruit that he talks about in the chapter. Connect with Jesus as though lives depend on it. Well, how do we connect with Jesus? How do you connect with anybody? Spend time with them. How do we spend time with Jesus? Scripture and prayer. Scripture and prayer. He said, man, preacher man, I ain't got time to like sit down and like study, I mean like dig into, give me the Greek and the Hebrew and I can't, I don't know what any of that mess means and I, I, I don't have time. Like I can read like one verse, you know, and get down to that. Honestly, we have more opportunity today to be in the Word than at any other time in history. Any other time in history. What do you do when you drive that doctor's appointment down Texarkana? Put on a podcast, put on Audible, or why don't you pull up the one-year Bible app? That thing will read to you. It will read to you. You say, I don't like the way that guy reads. They got like seven different readers on there. Just pop on another one. The Apple update, and then all of a sudden your reader's kind of funky. Well, they changed my reader. I need to go back to that other one. I don't, that was kind of weird. I don't like the way that person pauses. That guy smacks too much. Find you a different one. And it'll read to you. Like, let me give you an illustration. You tap on, I just tapped on the first one for today. There's a little play button down at the bottom. I listen to my little faster. They deprive the poor of justice and deny the rights of the needy among my people. Y'all pick up on all that? It's easier when you got headphones on to, to pick up on it. Uh, but you can do that, and, and I tell you what, if you're in the middle of the day and you're feeling disconnected, you're feeling like you're, you, you ended up, this anxiety is getting out of hand, you're connecting yourself to these false vines, pop up another day, get you another reading plan. Or just read straight through. One of my kids is doing that. He just is reading through it. Start in Genesis and keep going. You say, it's hard to pick up my Bible and read Leviticus. I bet it's a little easier to pick up your your phone and have somebody read it to you. (laughs) 
There's more opportunity today to be in the word than any other time in human history. Don't let the enemy lie to you and say you don't have time. That's a lie. I heard a guy say it this way, that he said he, he was really convicted by the Lord to stop telling people, I don't have time to do that, when they would come to him with a request. And he was the CEO of this big company, but he was a believer. He said, what I ended up doing is, is I came to the realization, it wasn't that I didn't have time to do what they wanted, it's that I was choosing not to do their thing and choosing to do something else. I was making a choice. This other thing was more important than what that person brought me. He said, and he said on this podcast, he goes, honestly, a lot of time it was. But it wasn't that I didn't have time. It's that I was choosing what to do with my time. He said, so in the conviction, what he had to come to the conclusion was, if I'm going to, to have time for the Lord, I have to choose it. Because if I don't choose it, I'm choosing other things over him. You say, well, okay. But I don't always I don't always drive a text or can I can't always pop on the, the, the Bible reading thing. I can I, okay, I can have it, you know, read to me while I'm getting ready in the morning, or maybe I can have, be intentional, get up an extra 15 minutes early and go and, and, and spend time with the Lord and pray. And I can do that, but but what happens when it comes to the middle of the day and, and I'm I'm really having trouble? I can't just pull out my phone in the middle of a meeting and and you know, turn on the Bible app, say, okay, everybody just stop for eight minutes while I do my Bible app. I need to be recalibrated because you people are driving me nuts. Some of y'all may need to say that. What helps in that moment is if we have Scripture memorized. Because you don't need to pull out your physical Bible or your Bible app to be able to say God's word in your mind. And if you got the words of God in your mind, nobody can stop you from saying it. Nobody can stop you from saying it. Those Christians throughout centuries who were persecuted and thrown in prison, how did they get by day after day anticipating being burned alive because of their faith? Because they had scripture memorized. And they were able in those jail cells being tortured to repeat the word of God and its power in them because they had it memorized. See, I'm not a good memorizer. I work on it. That's another lie of the enemy. You got the words of all those songs memorized. You got every NFL rule memorized. You can yell at those refs this afternoon. You got it all memorized. But when it comes to the word of God, Satan makes us think it's too hard. It's too difficult. There's too many these and thous and those and other stuff. Well, find you an easier translation than that. One you can understand. I preach from the ESV. You can do this. Christian Standard Bible is another one that's very accurate. New Living Translation, NIV. Get one you can understand and memorize Scripture and have it change you. You say, man, I've never been able to memorize Scripture my whole life. Let me give you an easy one right now. You ready? Everybody's about to memorize a verse. Everybody say, John 11.35. Jesus wept. John 11, 35, you're good now. You got one. It's going to snowball from here on. You got one. I always remember somebody says, you don't know no Bible? I know John eleven thirty five. 35. Shut your mouth. I got one. Connect to Jesus. Connect to him as though your life depends on it. Because it does. Connect to Jesus. And so the question, reading Jesus' words here in John 15, I am the true vine. Are you connected to Jesus today? Are you connected to Jesus today? Or have you been attempting to connect yourself to a false vine, missing the blessing of the true vine? Connecting to the true vine will change you. Are you connected to the vine the true vine. And connecting to the true vine defies culture. I was listening to a preacher this morning, and he was talking about the book of Philemon. It's a little tiny book. I mean, it's not even a whole page. You know, it's like two-thirds of a page. You can flip back over there and read it in, you know, 60 seconds. But in that book, what's happening is, is it's an appeal from Paul to a guy who was a pastor of a house church. This pastor of the house church had had a slave, which was 
common in their culture, different from the slavery we understand in America. But uh, at that time, up to 80% at some points of the Roman Empire were slaves. And this slave had, scholars believe, stolen from this pastor and run away. Culture would say that pastor, as a Roman citizen, had every right to chase that slave down and kill him right in the street. But Paul writes back to him and says, hey, your slave came to me in a Roman prison, and I found him, and I told him about Jesus, and he got saved. So this is what's happening, Mr. Pastor Man. I'm sending him home to you to forgive him. He says, I'm not demanding you forgive him, even though I'm Apostle Paul, and you're just some dude. I can, but I'm not. But you need to follow Jesus and forgive this man. And what we believe from Later writings, we don't know for sure, but we believe this guy, this slave, went back to that pastor of that house church and was forgiven. Paul didn't ask that the, the, the master, the pastor of that house church would free the slave. What he asked is that he would forgive him. Forgive him, something that lasts on into eternity. You see, what Jesus can do in us when we're connected to Jesus is he can create within us something that really is a superpower that will blow the minds of everyone in culture. Culture said that guy should have killed that other guy, the slave, run away. But Paul says, no, don't kill him, forgive him. If you're connected to Jesus, you can do something nobody else can do because you got something in you nobody else has. So are you connected to Jesus today? Are you connected to Jesus today? The other question is, if you're not, will you come and connect to him today? Maybe you need to come and connect to Jesus, the true vine, for the first time. Meaning you believe in him as God's son, that he died so all of your sins would be forgiven. Then he rose from the dead so you can live after you die. Will you believe in Jesus today and connect to the true vine today? Or maybe you need to stop attempting to connect to all these false vines and connect to the true vine where you were meant to be, Christian. Will you reconnect to him and his love and his joy as he designed you to be? Stop putting diesel in an unleaded engine. You're going to break the engine. You were meant for something different. Connect to the true vine. 